Being a kid in the 90s meant that I was set up to see technology through a special lens. It felt like technology could, at any moment and with any announcement, change forever. Now, when I was a kid, the technology I was most interested in was video games. And games have honestly always been a pretty good window into the way in which technology can progress by leaps and bounds. There was a magical feeling to these giant shifts, which felt like they happened overnight. I have a distinct memory of being six years old and playing Yoshi's Island, and then just two years later, by the time that I was eight, I was playing Super Mario 64. That's a massive jump. And seeing these types of radical leaps set me up to feel like that kind of change was always happening. It wasn't that things could change, it was that they almost certainly would change. And I grew up always wondering what the next generation of video game consoles would hold. While PCs remained beige rectangles for two decades, each generation of console brought something incredibly different to the table. To have been a Nintendo fan in the 90s and 2000s was to watch technology itself evolve as each system promised not only new power, but new ideas. Every console, controller, and game storage medium was different. Even in the aesthetics, the NES was a gray box with a two-button controller that took giant rectangular cartridges, bringing something previously stuck in arcades into the home. The SNES changed it up with a nice-looking purple console that was clearly meant to be displayed instead of hidden away, carts that emphasized the artwork and remained always in view, and an incredible upgrade in terms of graphics and sound. The N64 went 90s weird with a dark gray aesthetic and an optional bright red expansion pack that made you feel like you were slapping some aftermarket parts on your car, and a controller with three handles in defiance to the fact that humans only have two hands, while of course also bringing video games into three dimensions. Let's stop there. When the N64 was first announced, a journalist said that with it, gaming would never be the same. And although this is the sort of hyperbolic message that gets rolled out again and again in media, it was kind of true. That's the power of technology. As I read about the N64 as a kid, I couldn't help but try and imagine what 3D Nintendo games would feel like, what a Mario game would be like when played this way, or Zelda. I had grown so accustomed to two-dimensional worlds that I couldn't help but dream about what might come next. And as I grew older, I kept dreaming about what would come next, but not with video games anymore. Instead, other technologies. And I went from a clunky PC to a MacBook Pro, from Windows ME to Mac OS X, from Yahoo Mail to Gmail, from a T-Mobile sidekick to an iPhone, and so on. And with each new device, I found myself in awe of the way that things were changing at a rapid pace. But at some point, that progress, which felt like it had been moving at light speed, began to slow down. Years later, I still have all of those things I just mentioned. And some of them, like my iPhone, have certainly evolved, but the shift feels much more subtle than it did in the past. And certain technologies feel completely frozen in time. Gmail remains essentially the same product as it was when I first signed up all the way back in 2004. For context, that's the year that World of Warcraft came out, Shrek 2 was hitting the box office, and the iPhone was still three years away. I was still typing on some crazy Windows phone and happy about 2G internet. That's a long, long time ago. Recently, I've been noticing a trend. It feels like things are shifting again. And whereas a kid I was primarily focused on upgrades and tools for gaming, now I'm focused on tools for thought. And this space, which has felt pretty stagnant, suddenly feels revitalized with life. Recently, Basecamp has launched a new email service called Hey, which feels like the biggest rethink of mail in years, and without a doubt, the biggest challenger to Gmail that Google has ever seen. What makes it stand out is that it's an extremely opinionated piece of software. The user is asked upon getting a new email from any recipient if they ever want to see mail from that person again. And if they say no, then boom, that email address just won't show up in your inbox from that point forward. The fact that someone has made a challenger to Gmail at all is incredible. And I'm noticing that there are several different groups working on rethinks for the tools they care about most. Another one of these is Rome Research, which I've talked about in the past, which is making me completely rethink the way that I take notes. 
Now, this isn't due to some total restructuring of the note-taking process, but because a few things when done differently can make all the difference. A team called The Browser Company is reconsidering what an internet browser should look like. And though they don't have anything released at this point, they're working in public and sharing what they're thinking about on Twitter. As they reconsider core concepts of browsing like tabs, it feels extremely refreshing to see this stagnant piece of technology get much needed new life. Makespace is doing the same thing for video communication, reimagining it from the base level instead of just making the video or audio fidelity a little bit better. Holloway is creating beautiful ebooks designed to be read and shared in digital form. The list goes on and on. Before these newcomers arrived, these pieces of technology, note taking apps, email platforms, internet browsers, video chat services, ebooks, all felt incredibly stagnant. And as I think about the shift we're currently experiencing, my mind turns back to video games. But not the ones that I grew up playing, instead some that came before it, when a cult classic Mac application was released known as HyperCard. Joining us in the studio now is Bill Atkinson. Bill is an Apple fellow, the creator of HyperCard, also the creator of QuickDraw and Mac Paint. Next to Bill is Dan Winkler. Dan is the senior engineer at Apple working on the HyperCard project. HyperCard is a software erector set that lets uh, non-programmers put together interactive information. You use cards that contain graphics and text and buttons. Mm -hmm. Here I've got a stack of cards and I can press on this button and it will take me to another card. Okay, and that button's particular function is get to the next card. Right, we can have lots of buttons to do different things. Okay. Buttons can do things like dialing the phone and taking you to cards and um, uh, lots of different Whatever things. Whatever you tell it to do. Yeah. Okay. HyperCard was a method of creating interactive applications that many people still wish existed today. There was something elegant about the software that made creating interactive experiences compelling and easy. It was a WYSIWYG before WYSIWYGs and allowed anyone, even without real coding experience, to make what was essentially an app on their own. Unfortunately, that didn't exactly happen, but though it wasn't a commercial success, it ended up having a massive impact. A generation of programmers point to HyperCard as their entry point into the world and as the inspiration for the things that they want to make and have been making. So many of the apps that we use today come from this influence. And it also had another major influence on a pretty important piece of technology, the internet itself. HyperCard and Hypertext, a concept going back to the 1960s, both played a role in shaping the way that the internet moves users from link to link. Now this influence that HyperCard had on the world made me think, when all we see is the end product, it's hard to understand the decades of inspiration that went into its creation. As a kid, it felt like the N64 just popped up out of nowhere. But of course, that's not the case. Nintendo had partnered with a computer hardware company called Silicon Graphics in the early 90s. And this is how it always is. The iPhone that I bought in 2007 was being talked about and designed in 2001. Gmail was the brainchild of a developer who had been thinking about how to design an email system since 1996 and so on. These pieces of technology which we see popping into existence are the result of years of work by dedicated people and sometimes decades of influence by prior generations. The reality is that technology never actually magically shifts overnight. If anything, new technology comes in slow moving waves as new generations of creatives are inspired by those who came before them. People who are creating today are doing so because they were influenced by the tools that they grew up with, that they learned with, that they created with, and now it's their turn to make something for the world. And they are. Today's shifts in technology are letting people create beautiful interconnected catalogs of thought, connect with friends and family online, build an internet where the messages that we receive and the pages we browse feel thoughtful and considered instead of simply being just the way things are. And this too will bring forth an entirely new generation of development and creativity from those who use and are inspired by what's currently being developed. Though those magic overnight shifts are a lie, the waves that are constantly churning are far more powerful than we understand. And recognizing this has made me excited about the tools that are to come.